as I was, uh, as I awoke, there is an epidemic that's uh, apparently coursing throughout this world at an alarming rate. Now, this may seem like bad news, um, but it's not news that we haven't heard. So even this morning, on every news channel, every radio station, every social media outlet, there has been an announcement of this widespread sickness plaguing this world, and all of you are vulnerable. That's quite the case. From what I have seen and understand, it is more destructive than the Black Plague of the Middle Ages. It has garnered more recognition than that of AIDS. It is even more prominent than obesity within the United States of America. That's how widespread it is. It is more debilitating and reaches to further depths and complexity than that of cancer. It has transcended international borders and entered into every inhabitable country upon the face of the earth. This is happening right here and right now, this epidemic that's taking place. And you guys are like, what? I just heard about this. The most educated doctors so far of every and each nation and within each millennia have discussed how they might cure this disease. The renowned leaders and politicians that we have have discussed this widespread influence that it has. Yet neither of these entities can do anything about the rampant insufferability of this vile disease. You see, the sickness completely, this is what it does, it completely takes over the totality of the human, their body. Often the times uh, the disease will initially infect your uh, flesh, uh, your eyes, and your heart, and then it leads to altering the mind. That's what this disease does. Uh, and it starts from that, and it goes from doing that to giving you partial to even complete blindness. In addition, uh, eventually eliminating all sensitivity within your body. It's, it's a pretty amazing and incredible and hurtful and harmful disease. Once it gains control of these systems, it then destructively spreads throughout the rest of the body. The body becomes subject to its cruel decay. It consumes who they are. It isn't satisfied until it has brought death to the, to the host. The sickness preys on both young and old, rich, poor, male, female, male, whether you're ignorant or you're ingenious. The disease doesn't respect your birth order, your height, your weight, your shape, age, gender, IQ, social status, Facebook status, or Instagram, or whatever status that you have. It doesn't care. Essentially, if a human being resides in an area, then that area is subject to being infected. That is what happens with this disease. It is not a new disease. In fact, it has been around for thousands of years. They have found a cure for this disease. Now that's the part where people are like, I want to know. Because if it's everywhere, I want to be able to help myself against it. Now. Interesting enough, even though there is a cure, some people try to avoid it. Some people neglect it, and some others disregard and try an alternative, uh, alternative restoration practice. However, research and experience has proven that all practices have been unsuccessful in their attempt over this sickness, except one. There is only one cure for this disease. Some of you may be asking yourself, what is this sickness that the man from behind the pulpit is speaking about? What is this disease? What is this epidemic plaguing our world? And I will answer you simply. It is sin. It is sin. It has been around for thousands of years. It truly affects the heart, mind, and soul. It affects you with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and it cut continues to touch uh, the pride of life within you, your heart and your emotions. It does all these things. It can cause partial and even complete blindness within the host. That is what, what sin can do. It can cause paralysis. And since Gener Genesis 3, since sin has ravaged the souls of men, it has caused great men to stumble and civilizations to fall. It has caused blindness to the hearts of mankind has caused spiritual paralysis for many others. However, however, when this man named Jesus 
came to this earth, there was now a solution for the sin-sick soul. Jesus came as a redemptive remedy for all mankind. And so today I want to talk to you today about this. A sin-sick soul and a redemptive remedy. A sin-sick soul and a redemptive remedy. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Let's ask that he begin to move in this place and that he would begin to touch our hearts. That every heart, Lord Jesus, that has a, a sin in their life, that they would leave this place transformed. That they would leave redeemed that they would leave remedied, that we, they would leave, Lord Jesus, with a change of heart, with a change of mind, with a change of soul, that their bodies, their spiritual bodies, Lord, would not be affected by this thing, this sickness called sin, but that they would leave this place transformed in the newness of life that they can receive through the Holy Ghost, that they can leave this place uh, transformed, Lord, by the renewing of your word within their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, many of us are very familiar with Jesus' healing in the physical. It was not uncommon for Jesus to demonstrate his power by healing the sick. Within the Gospels, he healed those of different diseases. It mentions fevers. It mentions those who were spiritually tormented, the mentally impaired, those with paralysis. Jesus spoke these words of all that he was accomplishing as a physical healer to go and tell John. In Matthew, in the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 4 through 5, Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. He said, Disciples of John, tell this to John. He's discouraged right now, but I want him to know this. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preach to them. This is what Jesus was saying about himself in his ability to heal in the physical. However, Jesus was not interested just in being a remedy for physical sickness. That was not just his complete purpose. In coming here saying, I will heal a few sick folk. I'll be able to help them walk, give them sight for their blind eyes. It wasn't just that. He came with so much more of a greater purpose. He saw the sickness of sin that plagued the hearts of men. So he offered healing. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 through 6, we can read of a, a familiar passage about the man that was sick of the palsy. And it says in verse 2, And behold, they brought to him, that is Jesus, a man sick of the palsy. Now palsy was a, a, a sort of paralysis where he could not walk, where he could not move. It hindered him in his ability to uh, function um, properly. He was paralyzed, and he was lying on a bed, which if you were to read other uh, versions, uh, Gospels, they would say that he was lifted up by his friends to be able to come to see Jesus. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Don't worry. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, there were those who were watching, and they said, this man blasphemeth. What is this guy saying? What is this Jesus saying? He can't say that. He can't say, thy sins be forgiven thee. He can't say that. These scribes knew the law, and they knew that uh, the very letter of it, and yet they were questioning within themselves, why does this man have this certain ability and power? Why does he give himself this thing? And Jesus, he knew their thoughts, and he said, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Why are you thinking this? For whether is easier, what is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and walk? He said, what's easier here? Me to say, oh, you're forgiven, or Mr. Lame Paralysis Palsy Man, walk. Now, the scribes are probably thinking, both of those are pretty difficult. <laughs> you can't forgive unless you're God, and you can't heal that man. That man is lying on a bed. He can't move. He came in here with four people holding him up on each corner of the bed. There's no way that that's going to happen. 
I can only imagine what they may have been thinking. Their hearts were probably beating. They're wondering, what is this that he's going to do right now? But Jesus continues and says this. He says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. So that you know that I have power to forgive, this is what I'm going to do. He turns to the man that's sick of the palsy, and he says, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy house. And in verse number 7, the man arose, departed to his house. The very physical act declared the divinity and power of Jesus Christ and his ability to heal, not just in the physical, but in the spiritual. Not just in what we could see, not just in the body, but in the soul. Before Jesus, though, in this passage of Scripture, before he showed any interest, not one interest in the man's physical condition, he showed first an interest in the man's spiritual and eternal condition. You see, humanity could see that this man, man was paralyzed physically. But divinity could see that this man was paralyzed spiritually. From this passage, we find that there were those who doubted Jesus' authority and ability to heal spiritually through forgiveness. And even today, there are those who doubt that Jesus truly can heal their sin-sick souls. However, we have this promise in 1 John chapter 1. Uh, Verse 9, if we confess our sins, then he is faithful and he is just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We must remember that we have an advocate with the Father. We know the great physician. We know the healer. And can I let you know today, the healer is in the house. He's here in our midst. Yes, not just for your physical bodies, not just for your fever, cold, or headache, but he's here for the condition of of your heart. He's here for the condition of your soul. He's here for the condition of your mind to save and to heal that which is sa- needing saving and is sick. We must remember that confession proceeds forgiveness from sins and confession proceeds cleansing from all unrighteousness. If you desire today to have forgiveness in your life, a confession must be made. If you desire for a cleansing to take place from the unrighteousness and the things that you may have done, the alternate course, then what is necessary is confession. A recognition of one's own personal failures. One of the hardest things for people to recognize uh, when they go to the doctor, the doctor says to them, this is what you have. This is your condition. This is what you're dealing with. Now, the patient could do a number of different things in this situation. They could say, no, that's not the case. That's not true. Yeah, I have these symptoms. I have these issues on the outside, but no, I'm really okay. I'm really okay. They could say that. The patient could also say, yes, I recognize that and I'm going to do something about it. I recognize the condition that I have, and I need help. I need some way out of this. I need a remedy. Well, can I tell you today, there is a remedy for the sin-sick soul, and it's Jesus Christ. Jesus came for the sick of the palsy, but he also came for your sin-sick soul. He came for you today. He came for me today. He came for every man, woman, and child that ever came upon this earth, past, present, and future. His blood extends all the way far back and all the way far forward, and I'm thankful for that today. You see, Jesus had healed the man with the palsy, and after that event, If we were to continue reading in Matthew chapter 9, he came in contact with a future disciple called Matthew. Now in Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 12, this happens instantly after this event. It says Jesus passed forth from thence. Basically, he continued forward from the situation with the scribes, the man of the palsy. And as he was going, he saw a man named Matthew. Sitting at the receipt of custom, 
He was a tax collector. And he said unto him, follow me. Now, nobody liked tax collectors. Who here likes tax collectors today? Not very many hands. So we can see that back then, this was not a very well-liked man. Back then, the tax collectors were, were considered loathsome, and they were considered uh, uh, very um, lowly in their, in their actions and how they would treat people. Now, Jesus turns to this man that's not very well respected. Everybody hates him, and he says, follow me. Well, what does this man do? The very same thing that the man sick of the palsy did. He arose. We must arise to God's invitation. When he asks us, rise, we may think in ourselves, I can't. I can't go with you, Jesus. I can't be with you, Jesus. Do you not see my condition? But Jesus still says, arise. And he followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house when they were eating, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. These were the lowlifes. These were the, the thugs. These were the cheaters, the liars, the, the mean people of that day, the people that no one liked. And Jesus is eating with them. He's over at Culver's and, and, and dining with them. They got the to-go bag and they went home and they're, they're chomping at it and they're going after it and he's eating it up. And when the Pharisees saw it, this is what they said. They said unto his disciples, why does Jesus, your master, eat with these publicans and sinners? Why is he eating on this Culver's with all these, these horrible people? You know how bad they are. That man kicked my dog last week. I'm trying to be a little light. But they were hated. They were despised. Nobody liked the publicans, and nobody wanted to be near a sinner. And to be associated with them was very scary. You could be ostracized. But Jesus said this. When he heard these words, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. The religious leaders of the day, they criticized Jesus for spending time with sinners, which Jesus responded simply by saying, those who are healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick do. You may feel like you are spiritually sick because of this disease called sin, but I want to encourage you today that the doctor is in the house and there is a redemptive remedy god was manifest in the flesh as jesus christ to be born to live and to die for the sinners plagued by sin in colossians and in ephesians it refers to the forgiving power of jesus's blood in colossians 1 14 it says in whom we that is jesus we have redemption what through his blood for what? Even the forgiveness of sins. It came through his blood. It came through his death. It came through that process of dying out. Ephesians says the same thing. In whom, that is Jesus, we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. And can I say, his riches are are limitless. He does have no limit on what his riches of grace is able to extend forward unto you. The serum that he has for your remedy, it can just keep being poured out. It's not going to go away. He has it for you in your life. He has enough for my life. He has enough for the person down the street, down the road, across the way. He has it for every person in this world. He died for everyone. It was through his blood that we receive the forgiveness of sins. It's through his blood that we have the redemption remedy today. It's through his blood that your soul and my soul do not have to be sick any longer. And I'm thankful for that essentially our redemption or our payment for our sins was because of that blood which offers us in turn forgiveness you see we may have a sin sick soul but Jesus Christ was the redemptive remedy in order for us to partake of the forgiving power of Jesus blood this means he first had to die he had to die. And his blood had to be shed. 
Now the prophet Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would fill, fill this for our lives. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 5, it says, speaking and prophesying of Jesus, it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet, even though he did all that, we did esteem him stricken, smitten, smitten of God and afflicted. But, and then it says this, but it was, had a purpose. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or the correction of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. With his stripes, we are healed. You see, in the time of Jesus, they would punish prisoners, as they did to Jesus, by scourging them with a whip. This whip would carry upon it leather straps that would come forth from a handle, and upon it would be pieces of metal and bone and rock that were ingrained into the very uh, 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 pieces of leather that extended forth from the handle. So that when it came upon the person's body, it would strike into them and grasp in and then begin to pull at the flesh, which then would cause what is called stripes. And these stripes would be caused by those lashings. And stripes are often mentioned in the Bible. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul references them uh, numerous times in the book of Acts and also in the Corinthians about how he received himself stripes many times. These stripes would often allow for the skin to break and for the blood to flow. Jesus endured these stripes so that we could partake of forgiveness for our souls. So Jesus did something in the physical so that we could be redeemed in the spiritual. Jesus did something in the physical so we could be redeemed in the spiritual. Just keep that in the back of your mind there. Now I just, as I began to read this, this is a very powerful portion of scripture, but I wanted to know it even in greater depth. So I began to look up some of the key words that were um, in this. That word griefs in the Hebrew literally means disease and sickness. That we, word sorrows could be translated as affliction and pain. That word transgressions means rebellion and sin. That word iniquities means perverseness, evil, and sin. And that word peace means welfare, health. And lastly, that word um, stripes means hurts or wounds. Sorry, one last one, healed. The word healed at the very end of that passage means mended by stitching, cured, or made whole. So I began to put all these words together, and I, I kind of conglomerated this uh, general Hebrew definition if we were to expound upon the, the words, and this is what I came up with. If we were to reread Isaiah 53, 4 through 5, with these Hebrew words coming out of it, it would say this, it's true. He accepted our disease and sickness. He carried our affliction and pain, yet we regarded him as beaten, punished of God and afflicted. But he took on our disease, sickness, and pain for this purpose. He was wounded for our rebellion and sin. He was bruised for our perverseness and evil. The correction of our welfare and health was upon him as a responsibility. And with his bruises, his hurts, and his wounds, we are mended by a spiritual stitching. We are cured, and we are made whole. That's what it would say in the Hebrew if we extrapolated on that. Now, you may be thinking, Justin, you're going nuts. You're going crazy. That's a large portion of Scripture to be just kind of taken out. Go to the Hebrew. Go to the Word of God. Open it up. Look up the definitions. It's what it says. If we were to continue forward, we've read that Isaiah 53, 4. It says, surely he, that is Jesus, hath borne our griefs. He hath carried our sorrows. If we were to read further on in that chapter of Isaiah 53, in verses 11 and 12, it says this, He shall see of the travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear, 
he shall bear their iniquities. It continues on further. It says, therefore, will I divide him a portion that is Jesus with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors, one on his left and one upon his right. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, the Hebrew word for sorrows, as I mentioned earlier, meant affliction and pain. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that Jesus carried our sorrows. Otherwise, he carried our affliction and pain. The Hebrew word for carried is once again seen in Isaiah 53, 11, For he shall bear or carry their iniquities. That same word bear is the same one used for carry earlier in the verse in verse 4. Jesus is now being prophesied to carry our iniquities. So put this all together, and what does it say? It says, Jesus carried our sorrows to the cross, which was the affliction and pain that iniquity was causing us. That is literally what it says when you combine the verse 4 to the verse 12 and verse 11. Then you look at verse 12. We looked at the word grief earlier. It meant disease. It meant sickness. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that Jesus hath borne our griefs. That's another way of saying he accepted it or he put it upon himself, almost in a way carried. Otherwise, he accepted the disease and sickness. Now, the Hebrew word for born is used once again, again in verse 12. And this is what it's referenced with. And he bear, he born, the sin of many. Again, he carried our afflictions and pains, and he bore our disease and sickness. Jesus has borne our griefs, which was the disease and sickness of sin. Now, after this extensive ex extrapolation, you might think, Justin, you are going nuts. You are going outside of your head. You are trying to take scriptures from here and trying to extrapolate them over here and combine them and throw them all together, shake them up and but I'm not, because I go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, and it says it very clearly as Peter references Isaiah chapter 53. He says, who his own self, Jesus, bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. It says that plainly. We have another witness who declares it. He had a revelation of what Jesus did upon that cross. When he was upon that cross, he bore our sins. He carried those sins. He accepted them upon himself and said, I'm taking these to a cross to die for them, for you and for you and for me. He did that so that I could have a sin-sick soul be once again redeemed. I'm a new man. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus, not because of myself, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on Calvary for a wretched man like me and maybe a wretched man or woman like you. I'm so thankful. I'm so happy. I'm so glad. That's what I get to take a part of. I'm not sick anymore. I'm healed. I'm redeemed. I have the cure. I have the cure. I have the cure. And you can have it. You may not feel like you can go on anymore. You may feel lame like the one the like the paralysis of that palsy man. You may feel that you're blind in your heart. You may feel you can't go on anymore. You feel every day that it's a drudgery, that you're dying inside your heart. But let you know today that today there is a man named Jesus. Yes, he may have been dead, but his spirit lives on and it can live inside each and every one of us. It's flowing. It's moving. It's operable today. The Old Testament declares it. The Gospels prove it. And Peter and the rest of the apostles and the New Testament proclaim it. We have the truth that his blood was there for us. I'm so thankful for that truth. I'm so thankful for the power of his blood. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just give him a hand clap of praise in this place. Oh, no, no. Oh, you are worthy, Jesus. There is none like you, God. Thank you for what you did upon Calvary. Thank you for bearing those sins upon that tree, that cross. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> now, Peter had referenced, as I mentioned here, the prophecy of Isaiah, <coughs> that we were healed by the stripes of Jesus. Peter stated that Jesus bore our sins, which is exactly how it was said in Isaiah 53, 4, verse 11, and in verse 12. Not only that, Peter let us know that because our sins died on that cross, because they died on that cross, when Jesus died, now we should be able to live unto righteousness. We are forgiven and now have been given the ability to do that which is right. To put it plainly, Jesus acted as the redemptive remedy for your sin-sick soul. And now you don't have to be paralyzed by the sin any longer. You don't have to have it hinder you in your life. You don't have to have it cause you to have a stutter or cause you to have a lame walk. You don't have to have it cause you blindness where you're tripping up on everything that comes into your path. No longer, not anymore, because of what he did on Calvary. In front of the scribes, Jesus pr proved his ability to forgive sin by physically healing the paralyzed man of the palsy before their eyes. I said earlier that I want you to put something in the back of your mind. I said, Jesus did something in the physical to prove something in the spiritual. Jesus did something in the physical to prove something in the spiritual. He did that upon the cross for your hearts, minds, and souls, for your spirit. But he also did that for the man of the palsy. He healed him in the physical to prove that he could do it in the spiritual for forgiving him. Then, in front of all humanity, Jesus proved his ability to forgive you and I by physically dying upon the cross as the redemptive remedy for our sin-sick souls. The scribes, they doubted that Jesus could work in a spiritual capacity through the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus proved them wrong by show them, showing them that he could, what he could do in the physical. Both with the man of the palsy and at the cross, Jesus proved the authenticity of his divinity by doing something miraculous in the physical. Jesus proved the authenticity of his divinity by doing something miraculous in the physical. Today, Jesus wants to prove his authenticity as the doctor in your life who can heal you today. You see, in the physical, he has already died for your sins to prove to us that he can forgive our sins. For without the sacrifice of his blood, we could not have the forgiveness of sins. And we read those scriptures earlier in Colossians and in Ephesians. And if you were to read the book of Hebrews, it would also refer to that, that the blood of bulls and goats, they were insufficient. We sacrifice that thing, it's not going to make a difference. It would just kind of bring the remembrance of those sins the very next year. But... If you were to read later on in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4 through 18, it says that Jesus became the sacrifice. So that all those things that were past, all those things in the present, and all those things in the future would be covered because of his blood, because of his sacrifice. He did something in the physical for our spiritual well-being. He shows that as a consistent thing that he does throughout the scripture. He did it with the man of the palsy. He did it upon the cross. If you have spiritual blindness, then Jesus can help you receive your sight. If you have stumbled as a lame man in your walk with God, then Jesus can give you new strength to walk. If you are decaying spiritually, then Jesus can cleanse your soul. If you feel spiritually dead, Jesus will help you to be raised up again. If you feel emotionally downtrodden, well, Jesus has a word for you. The disease of sin does not have dominion over you any longer. Why? Because you have the redemptive remedy of Jesus Christ.
In 1 John chapter 1, 7 through 9, it says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, his son cleanses us. It cleanseth us. That E-T-H at the end means it continues to cleanse us. So you may have received your initial cleansing when you repented of your sins, when you were baptized in the name of Jesus in a baptismal tank or in a lake somewhere. And you may have received your cleansing when you received the gift of the Holy Ghost as it poured throughout your life. But can I tell you, the blood still works. You've been covered by the blood and it's still working on your life. It's cleansing every single day. And we can call upon that name to have that blood applied to our life and say, Lord Jesus, I'm not too far gone. I'm not too far gone. I have the redemptive remedy. I have a connection to the source. I have a connection to the cure. And you're it, Jesus. And I'm not leaving that. I'm having you come into my life. And I'm allowing the blood to flow throughout my life so sin has no precedence any longer. Now, there are those, it says in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. It says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it says, and I read this verse earlier in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We recognize today that Jesus' death upon the cross and the shedding of his blood is what gave us the redemptive remedy for our sin-sick souls. We identify that today. And there is not a single one of us here today that can honestly say, I have never sinned. There's not a perfect person in the house. I'm sorry. And if you are that person, we can talk later and we can help you with scripture. But we must remember this, that there is a way, there is a prescription. It's his blood being applied to our life. But the way that we apply it to our life, we have to have confession. Confession proceeds forgiveness from sins. And confession proceeds cleansing from unrighteousness. Not just some unrighteousness, just this unrighteousness or that unrighteousness, it says actually all unrighteousness. That means you're not too big of a sinner. You're not too sick. The disease of sin isn't too much for Jesus to handle. That is a wonderful thing in itself. If we would all stand. I've said many things. But I want you to know this. There is a disease out there called sin. But there's a cure. There's a remedy for redemption called Jesus Christ. And if you desire spiritual healing today, then I invite you to come to this altar in faith confessing. Jesus will hear you. And Jesus will heal you. Whatever your case may be. Maybe you need just an adjustment with your walk. Maybe you feel you haven't been seeing just as he wants you to see. Maybe you feel a little decay on the inside at times. Maybe there's a portion of your heart that you haven't given to him completely. Maybe you feel dead at times. But whatever the case might be, we all deal with sin. We live in a sinful world. We try to compete against it, but it affects our eyes. It affects our pride, our emotions. It affects our flesh. But we're overcomers because we have the redemptive remedy. In James chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, this scripture setting is typically used to say, is any sick among you? Call for the elders of the church. Have everyone come forward. Anoint them. Pray for them. But the words there in that passage of scripture, I know I might be not just using it for the physical, but what Jesus did in the physical did something for the spiritual. Because what it says in verse 15 is this, that the prayer of faith shall save the sick. It didn't say heal the sick, it said save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. Again, 
Are you willing to arise to the occasion? Are you willing to arise to the invitation? And he says this after that prayer of faith. If he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. This was spoken to the church. This wasn't spoken to anybody. This was spoken to the church. We need Jesus. So I invite you. Now, if you specifically, specifically would like healing over your body, and you'd like prayer from the ministry here and the elders of the church, I invite you to come to the center, and they will lay their hands on you, and they will pray for you. And it says here that the prayer of faith will save the sick and that the sins that have been committed will be forgiven. Why? Because there's been a confession. So I invite you to come. I invite you to come to this altar where you can be able to have your sin-sick soul remedied by the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. He's working today, church.